I'm going to invite Conwee to come up. Are you coming up? Is your son here? Come on up. This is delight. Since you guys weren't that Pentecostal, she's going to kick us off, right? <laughs> Go ahead, tell your story. Or do you want me to start it? Yeah, go ahead. What shall I say unto the Lord? All I have to say is thank you, Lord. What shall I say unto the Lord? All I have to say is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All I have to say is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All I have to say is thank you, Lord. Amen. I have a testimony this morning to thank God for, the, for saving the, my, my son's life. That's uh, two Wednesdays ago. They went to swim at Eastling, and while there, I was at home, and suddenly I got a call that he almost drowned. And uh, I'll just explain what they told me. Actually, when they got there, he didn't have the life jacket. He went and dived inside the water and couldn't come out again. So he was down there crying, help, help, nobody could hear him. And the lifeguard went down, saw him, and thought he was playing because, like, his hands and legs were just giving way. So he thought he was playing. He came out, stayed for a while, and went down again and found him. That's when he brought him. According to the report, he was down there for 20 minutes plus. <laughs> and this could only be the hand of God. So that's why I want to say, thank you, Lord. That's why I sing the song, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All I have to say is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All I have to say is thank you, Lord. I equally want to thank God today. Today is my birthday, and I give God all the praise. Amen. 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 So you're good? Yeah. Awesome. That's crazy. <laughs> Anything else you want to say? No. <laughs> all right. I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> Well, if I was under the water for 20 minutes, that's impressive. That's an act of God. How bad do you think he wanted a breath? So, I'll tell you a story. Last Sunday, I skipped church. <gasps> okay, Steve came with me, my daughter Kendra and Zeke came. We decided to go hiking. So we went down to Grand Cache, and uh, I said, well, let's hike. Grand Mountain, because it's right by Grand Cache, and then we can have sushi right away after, because I don't know if you've had Grand Cache sushi, but it's better than you think. <laughs> it's pretty good. Anyway, so we, we decided, we parked by the cemetery, and uh, there's the power line hike. Never done it. Heard a couple people did it. So we started doing this hike, and you get into the hike, and it's just like relentlessly steep. Anyone here done this hike? Oh, we got one. It's pretty steep, hey? It doesn't, it just goes on and on and on. And what I realized as I'm hiking this is, I am no longer in good shape. <laughs> I'm a shape, but it ain't good. My daughter, who's 18, is walking backwards up the hill, looking at us like, come on, you guys, you're so slow. What I realized as I'm hiking is my intense need for oxygen. Turns out, you breathe really hard and rapidly, as you're trying to get up this hill that's just steep, steep, steep. So what I realized in the hike is, I think a total, your Kendra's phone said it was like 13 kilometers, like 
there and back total. But the sign said it was the elevation was like, it was like 1,600 meters. You go up. But it's, it's, you get to a certain point in this hike, and all of a sudden you can see the top. And you're like, oh, finally we can see the top. But then you realize there's a saddle back, and it drops straight down. And then the steep parts to come, the straight back up the other side. So as we were getting near the top, Kendra and I, we just pushed on. We left Steve and Zeke behind. I was trying to slow Kendra down, but I couldn't, so I stayed with her in case animals would attack her. <laughs> they would have been feared by my heavy breathing. <laughs> but as we got near the top, Kendra said, wow, I can notice that it's harder to breathe up here. So I thought I'd look it up. So sitting as we are right now in Grand Prairie, the oxygen level is 19.4%. Up on the top of that mountain, it's only 16.3. So not much of a difference. But when you're breathing hard, you could really feel it. And I was thinking through this and thinking, how impactful is our breath? How much do we need air? Do we need oxygen? Do we need life? And is it life to us? The light story of drowning is quite fitting. He needed oxygen. And somehow the Lord sustains him. Why do I tell you this? Is because sometimes we breathe in things that are very toxic to us, right? Smoke, chemicals, whatever it is you're breathing in. But I think sometimes we're breathing in stuff that's spiritually toxic to us, and we've got to be careful about that. We can get caught up in things that distract us and lead us away from what God desires for our lives. And I think it's a small little shift, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm going down the wrong path. We can easily stop and go, no, this is too hard. I'm going to turn around and go back down the mountain. I don't want to keep going. So the scripture I'm preaching today is continuing where Steve left off. This is Philippians 3, 1 to 11. If you have a Bible, or it might get put up there. It says this. It says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision. Who worship the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. And put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count things to be lost in viewing the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. And may be found in him, not having righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in, in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Lord, we read your scripture today, and we just ask that it would just penetrate our hearts. Would you let your truth radiate and reign in us? Would you speak to us through this passage, I pray? In Jesus' name, amen. You've probably read this passage, but at the start of the passage, it says to rejoice in the Lord. And I think there we have to stop and take a deep breath. I might cough. <coughs> Take a deep breath and slow down. Sometimes we need to do this as we go through life because we get busy and we get distracted. And we need to stop and go, okay, am I rejoicing? Am I thankful for what God has done, for what God is doing? Or am I getting sidetracked with my problems and they become really big things? But really, your problem is not big to God. It's tiny. God can just go, oh, I can fix that like that. 
And we think our problem is so significant, but I want you to think about a problem as a breath. Take a deep breath. Jesus can help that problem. Slow down, calm down. God's in control. When we move out of the way, watch what he does. Watch how God can save us and change our lives. So this passage, Paul starts about talking. He says, beware of the evil dogs. So my point of this is beware of doing things on your own strength and by yourself. The evil dogs, this is, this is those that lead us astray to sin. We've got to beware of that. These are the things that will pull us away from God. I don't need to point out the sin in your life. You probably already know it. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit, that's his job. I don't actually care what your sin is because we all got it. But we need to be aware of what it is. And we have to stop and go, what are the things that are leading us astray? So here Paul talks about circumcision. So the, the whole basis of circumcision was legalistic. It was all about being legalistic. Look, Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day because that's what the law says. I'm so awesome. Right? Paul went on to say, if there's anyone who has a reason to boast in the flesh, it was him. He was a Pharisee. He was a real Jew. He, he was the one who was persecuting the church because they weren't following the right rules of the Jewish law. And it was all about legalism. And I think we can get caught up in legalism and it can distract us and pulls us away because it's not circumcision is what you need. It's the circumcision of the heart, right? It's that cutting of a sensitive area in your life to go, okay, I need this cut and exposed to the Lord. Because sometimes we close ourselves off to God and we get busy and distracted and we can run down different paths. But, but here Paul is saying, don't get caught up in these things. Because Jesus is so much better than this. Don't do it on your own strength. Because you can't do it on your own. But we want to do it on our own, right? We want to push past. We want to think that I got this together. Look what I've done with my life. I can tell you, if I was in control of my life, it would be a mess. But with Jesus in control, it's like, oh my goodness. I can't believe that happened. He did that? That's pretty awesome. So how do we allow others to help us? And how do we not do things on our own strength? I think part of this is letting go and letting the Holy Spirit guide you and help you. The next point Paul talked about was the impact of relationship with Jesus. See, Paul said a few things that are pretty significant in this passage. He said, nothing matters compared to Christ. You can follow the law to the best of your ability, and Paul did. And he came short. He was the one that had it all together, that was going through it all. But Paul said this, losing everything is worth it if you gain Jesus. Take a breath there. Just camp there for a second. Losing everything is worth it if you gain Jesus. What don't you want to lose? What possessions do you have that maybe you don't want to lose? I have a couple motorbikes that I really don't want to lose. Right? Do we put those things on the altar? Do we say, God, here is my life, and you can have all of it? Take a deep breath and say, God, it's yours. Whatever you want to do, whatever this looks like. I remember thinking, this is a long time ago when I was working down in Calgary, this was like before I was married, so this was in the 1990s. It's a long time ago. See, now you understand why hiking is so hard at my age. So I was working down in Calgary, and I was making like $30,000 a year. That was a full-time job. Nowadays, that's probably a part-time job. I don't even know. But I remember thinking when I was working at that job, man, if I only made like over $50,000, then, oh, it would be so perfect. I would have everything. Well, fast forward quite a few years, and I was working here at the church, and I was making about that money, and I thought, holy, this is nothing. You can't support a family on this, right? I had a second job while I worked here. And then I thought to myself, man, if you made over like $100,000, then that would be enough, right? I don't think it ever is. When's enough enough? Right? Because we can put 
we put this value in something and maybe I put that value in money more than God, thinking that if I had this, then my life would be like what? Truth is, is it's not. Right? There's a lot of people in our community that work a lot of hours out in the oil field. Right? They're gone. They're working, you know, 12-hour days, seven days a week. Is it really worth it? I don't know. It depends what your priorities are. I realized in my life that I want to spend time with my family and friends. That's really what matters to me, right? I enjoy the work that I do, but it's for the Lord. And when it's for the Lord, then it doesn't matter about the money because you're trusting God to take care of these things. And I think as we let go and we take that breath and go, okay, Jesus, what do you want me to do? And we let go of the things of the world. We kind of let them fall away. Jesus spoke to a rich young ruler in Matthew 19. This is a man who had done everything right. He'd been successful. And he says, Jesus, I've done all things right. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does Jesus say to him? Sell all that you have. Ooh. Ooh, that hurts. Colin, why don't you just sell all that you have and become a missionary? in some country with lots of mosquitoes. <laughs> Ugh, I'm just crawling out of my skin thinking about that. But this is, what, this is what Jesus is saying to this man. Sell all that you have. So first part is sell it all. Surrender. Surrender everything. Surrender to me. And then come and follow me. Come and have a relationship with me. See, that's what Paul had to do in his life, right? Everything was going well for Paul until he had that encounter with Jesus. And then everything changed. Part of this is, for me, I realized this year ago, I had to take the dreams that I had in my life and surrender them to Jesus. And just lay them down and go, okay, these are, this is what I have, but I'll give them to you. And he gives them back and they're better. The next point I have from this passage is, it's about being found in Jesus. There's something about being forgiven, washed clean, by the work of Jesus on the cross, because he chose to die for me, to give me life, and that abundant life in him. So Paul says being found in Jesus is three things. The first, this is the power of his resurrection. Do you realize that that's available to us, that same power that raised Christ from the dead, that God wants to have that working through our lives? I think we miss that. I think new believers have that. You can see that spark in their eyes. But as you come to church, I think sometimes we kind of get complacent. And we kind of forget about, wait a minute. What about the power of God? What about the power of God that can raise someone's son that was in the water for 20 minutes? That's amazing. No wonder she's thankful. Should be. And so should we. But there's this power that we need to grab onto and grab a hold of and let it flow through our life. But that's all about that surrender, letting go, letting go your plans, your dreams, your desires, laying down yourself and allowing the Holy Spirit to move through you. Galatians 5 says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? What was it that got caught into your lungs that you were breathing in, listening to, hearing the media, the toxic, whatever it is from the world that kind of pulls us aside, right? In Scripture it says, a little bit of leaven goes through the whole lump of dough, and it draws you aside. What are the little things in our life that kind of pull us the wrong ways that we need to let the Holy Spirit reveal to us and go, oh, i got to change that. i got to make some changes. Because we need to allow the power of Christ's resurrection to flow through us so that we are just walking in faith, confident knowing that God's going to do a work and it's going to be really good. The second thing is the fellowship of his suffering. Years ago, I went to Bolivia on a missions trip. But just before I went to Bolivia, I was at probably one of the lowest points of my life. I felt so burnt out. I felt so alone. And I went to two people and I said, hey, I'm just, I don't know what to do. I'm burnt out. I'm exhausted. I'm done. And I was just kind of pouring out my heart. And I said, whoa, yeah, I guess you should figure that out. And I just kind of went, okay, that wasn't helpful. 
And so then, it was like a week later, we jump on a plane to go to Bolivia. I used to like flying before I went to Bolivia. That trip wrecked me for flying. I mean, it was probably worse for Steve because he had to sit between Russell and I. We had like that middle rows, and Russell and me are not small people. But we get down to Bolivia, and I'm exhausted, and I'm done. And I remember saying to Steve and Russell, I just need you guys to pray with me. They were my roommates on this trip, and I was in a bad place. And I just kind of opened up to them. And I remember just sitting in (laughs) the room at times. And I didn't even have my own room, so you couldn't just run and hide and be by yourself. I was sitting in the room, and we always sat in the room because in Bolivia... You're not allowed to sit and put your feet up on a coffee table. Right, Debbie? What a crazy rule. (laughs) How do you even relax? So we'd go sit in the bedroom with our feet on the bed because that's, then your feet were up. Anyways, I would sit there and I would just be crying. And I would just, I was just, every time I phoned my wife on that trip, I would just, I was just crying my eyes out. And I had gotten to a place where I was so done But there's something that happens when you let others know what you're going through, right? When you tell them about your sufferings and what you're facing, because they supported me and they prayed for me. They just listened and prayed. God begins to do the the rest. But to share in the sufferings means the fellowship of his sufferings. What does it look like to understand what Jesus went through for you? What did Jesus go through for you? Think of that, him dying on the cross, and he thought about each one of you and me. He thought about the sin in our life, and he said, I'm going to die for you so that you can have life. And we understand that Jesus knew what he was walking into, and he still did it. Sometimes I think we know things that we're called to walk into, and we're like, yeah, no, Lord, not going any further. So when we were hiking, we got to a spot and there was an edge of a cliff. So I just go to the edge of the cliff. I'm looking down and Kendra's like, Dad! I'm like, what? And she's like, that makes me feel fear when you're that close to the cliff. And, and you realize that I, the first time I ever discovered the fear of heights was when Karsten, my son, was really little and we were on a mountain and, and we got to a cliff and I was standing at the cliff looking. Cause there was a railing back here, but I jumped over that. because <laughs> Why follow the rules? Okay, I'll get in trouble anyways. Kim, I'm not telling that illustration that I told you because she said it will offend the legalistic people. So anyways, I tell this one. So there was the railing. I jumped the railing. I don't think my wife did, but Karsten and I jumped this railing. You were there that time, yes, with Karsten and I. He was like, Two years old. Anyways, we can fight later about this. So I was standing on the edge of this cliff, and Carson comes up beside me, and I went, and I realized the fear of heights, because I thought, oh boy, if he falls. But sometimes we have to get to the place of, do we know the sufferings of those around us? Do we know the sufferings of Jesus? Do we have a fellowship of suffering where we're walking through life with Christ knowing that he died for me. There's that reminder of the cross. That's why we have, well, there's a cross behind the screen, but we've hit it here at this church. We just have a little one over here. But when you look at the cross, when you look at the cross, it's that reminder of what Jesus did for you. He chose to die on the cross so that we could have life. And that's the fellowship of suffering, knowing that whatever you walk through, it's okay. You're going to walk through life, and it's going to sometimes suck. But how do you rejoice in the suffering? How do you rejoice in the trial? Right? Doing this hike up this mountain, you kind of have to embrace the suck of that. You should go try that hike. It's the power line hike. Just go try it. It's pretty steep and relentless. Or maybe you're in really good shape and it won't be hard at all. With that said, there was a guy that did it twice while we were hiking at once. (laughs) And he was older than me. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm just training for the death race again. The death race was like three weeks ago. He finished third in the master's class. It was pretty impressive to watch him do it twice when we did it once. 
just saying, we're out of shape. But when you realize the suffering of walking through those things, there's a joy that comes. I, was, I did the leadership summit at the Alliance Church a couple weeks ago, and the one professor, he was um, out of Harvard University. He teaches in the business uh, division department. And one of the courses that he teaches is about happiness. And he says he has a waiting list of about almost 400 people for this course every semester. And uh, he says there's a... There's always a, someone has a webcam in there recording it so other people can watch this course. And one thing he says about happiness is you have to have an achievement. Something that you've worked really hard towards because that's what brings happiness. Is having some sort of success based on working hard towards something. And I think in our lives that's part of a little bit of suffering. As we suffer, we grow. No one, no one goes through life and is grows because life is so peaceful and easy. We grow in the trials and in the hard times. And this is that fellowship of suffering with Christ. What does it look like for you to rejoice in the trial? So when trials come in my life, I really try to have that attitude. Not always, but I really try to have that attitude of, okay, what do I need to learn in this moment? Or if someone triggers you, this happens to me often, usually when my mom says something to me, because I'm a grown adult, and she's trying to tell me how to live my life. And it's like, why is this triggering me? Because I have something to deal with, right? The pro if you get triggered by someone, you have the problem. They were the gift to you. You'll figure it out later on, hopefully. But this is the reality, right? What does it look like to rejoice in the suffering? To rejoice in the trial? To allow the Holy Spirit to work and grow in you? The third part is being conformed to his death. I think this one's really hard. Because to live with intentional purpose is really hard. To live a life where you're putting to death the desires of the flesh, where you're putting to death your old self, and repeatedly every day, is something falling on me? When we put things to death, it's hard to do. But Jesus did that. He walked right into death, fully knowing what he was dying for because he had a purpose. He had a purpose to go, I'm going to walk right into this for you guys so that you may have life. And I think we need to come to that place of being conformed to death for Christ's sake. First, laying down yourself your old nature, laying down these things so that we can have abundant life and then living a life not driven by fear, but living a life that says, okay, God, where do you want to take me? What do you want me to do? Because I've surrendered it all. Let's go. Let's have some fun. Let's take this on. And I think that's what he wants us to do because there's a joy that comes in that, right? Death is not the end. It is not the end. And I think sometimes we get caught up and we fear a physical death. But it is not the end. God has so much more. But he's got work for you to do here today on this earth. What does it look like as you live with intentional purpose? Um, you may not tell, but I go to the gym. I go to the gym as often as I can at lunch hours with a couple buddies. And I'll tell you this. I do not like going to the gym I never want to go to the gym. The best part of going to the gym is leaving it. <laughs> because the gym is nothing but suffering and death. It is just, you're, you're doing things you don't, why? <laughs> but I understand that it's good for my health, it's good for my energy, and I need this in my life. But I think there's an analogy there that we need to take on. Sometimes God's going to ask you things to do that you're not going to enjoy. But when you see the end goal, you're going to look back and go, wow, I got to be part of that person's life? You should have seen how difficult they were before. <laughs> look what God did, and I loved them, right? And that's that opportunity. How many movies have we watched where you see the annoying person? We watched that movie yesterday, Kendra. What was it called? It was the Narnia one, the third one. 
Have you seen that one? And Eustace is in that movie? Oh, I called the kid useless the whole time. <laughs> but in the movie, you see this, this kid that just needed to be loved. He just didn't need to care for. And he needed to, you know, have, well, in the movie, Aslan, who represents Jesus, speak into his life and everything changes. But who are the people around you that you maybe need to suffer with them? Come alongside them. Be conformed to Christ's death in their life because being around them maybe feels like death to you. If it's your spouse, you need counseling because you chose to be around them. But sometimes we got to choose to minister to people. And there's, there's a power that comes through that. But what does it look like in our life as we walk through these trials knowing that God has a plan, he's got an outcome, and it's really good for you. But as we walk through the surrender, as we walk through laying down our life and letting God fill us with a purpose, there's an excitement that comes. And I think that's when the power of God gets poured out in your life. And you get excited and you get lifted up because you're like, okay, this is pretty cool. Yeah, there's some trials, but man, this is the abundant life that the Bible's talking about. But we got to put to death our flesh. And I'll give you an example of how to do this. Hold your breath. How long can you hold your breath for? Because your flesh is going to cry out, I need to breathe. I, I, I've read that like the professional divers that dive down, they can, they can hold their breath to the point of being passed out. I can make it maybe like around a minute if I really try. And that's not very good. But if you hold your breath long enough, your flesh is going to cry out, breathe, breathe, get some air going into you. And we have to realize how weak we are in the flesh. And this is why we need help. We need others to help us, and we need to realize that we need Jesus flowing through our lungs. Is Jesus the breath in your lungs? Is he filling you with life and power, or what are you breathing in? What things are you breathing in that aren't helpful for you? I can't imagine what your son felt like when he breathed in water. That must have been terrifying. But we need to bring in life. But somehow, I think in his story, the breath of God filled his lungs. Because he's here today. So the name for God in Hebrew is Y-H-W-H. They didn't put vowels in it, right? You know why? Because they didn't want to actually say it. But what does it sound like to you when you say Yahweh? It's breathing in and bringing out. And what I want you to take from this today is that we need to breathe in God and breathe him out. Breathe in God. Breathe him out. Let him control your life. Let him transform your life. Let him move through you. Let your breath be blessings to others around you. The headline in my Bible for chapter 3 says, The goal of life. The goal of life is found in a relationship with Christ. It's found in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of going through trials and surrendering your life to him and letting go, letting him guide you. Let's pray. God, we give you praise that you are at work in us, that you have plans for us. I pray that when our breath becomes labored, you would remind us that you are our breath of life, that you would calm us and relax us, that we would not get captivated by worry and fear and the things of the world, but we'd be captivated by you. So Jesus, we invite you to take control over us, fill us, and flood us with your love. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.